crowd getting excited. There's Mr. Mandela, Mr. Nelson Mandela, a free man taking his first steps into a new South Africa. Stay here, Paul. Hey, kids. We don't see shooting Nelson Mandela here. My name is Paul Cook and I'm a film lecturer at the University of Leeds. Over the last two years I've been working with groups of young people in South Africa using film to explore the legacy of the past and to raise awareness of the issues that they face today. Well, I was particularly interested in this kind of the so-called born free generation, the generation of people that grew up since the end of apartheid and how they understood the kind of deals that Mandela had to make in order to facilitate the transition from apartheid to democracy and also just to keep the country together. Mandela did, I think everyone agrees, a fantastic job but there was a sense of could he have gone further? Where is the nation today? It's in that class. On that class, no other, no other. We saw that class come here, So Pendolani is now 15, but when when I first met him, I thought he was about 11. I mean, he looks a, he looks kind of like uh, a similar age to my daughter. But um, but the one really big thing that's different about any other kids I've ever come across is like you know, whilst he sort of seemed to be physically quite quite young. He had these really old eyes, like you can see it there, you know, he's just got a real sense of, you know, having experienced life. After my mother died, my uncle go to Eastern Cape to fetch me. When I was staying here, there was this guy who said, uh, he's my father. But he, after the time, he said, I am not your father. After that, my uncle started treating me badly. So I was sleeping on a car, I decided, no, if these people they think I don't I don't I can't live without them. I can live and prove them wrong. Well yeah, Pendolani has been working with us on uh, a project that we've been running with uh, the Bishop Simeon Trust and Temba Interactive this year. We've been working with groups of vulnerable children who use so-called safe parks um, in the townships around Johannesburg. A safe park is a safe space where vulnerable children get a meal for the day to kind of concentrate in school or to just not be hungry. In some of these communities, it's almost like your life is already mapped out for you. You'll get pregnant at 16, you'll live off government grants, um, and that's all you'll ever be until you're an old person in the cycle. What we've been doing is running a filmmaking project, getting them to make films about some of the issues that they think particularly affect their society, that they think the world should know about. So the Leeds project came in to be housed by the Youth Committee project, where we work with the various safe parks to establish youth committees within the safe park. And in establishing those youth committees, it's all about ensuring that um, the beneficiaries of the safe park have a voice and they're able to speak through issues within the safe park and outside of the safe park and then building their skills to be able to run their own campaigns, raise their own awareness. And so the film project came in as the first offering of a tangible skill that we can offer the youth. The most difficult thing is about when you, when you shoot, sometimes you forget. Some, sometimes when you press where you must focus on, if, if take a pitch. So, it cut at the same time. So it's very difficult. You must be very, very focused. And you must be very, very clear with your job and do it well. Our freedom is what about blessers. Blessers are those men who use our sisters for sex to, our sisters, they want them because they, sometimes there's no choice. 
so they want money. So bless all of those people who give money to our sisters. We want to make film about blessers because blessers are very dangerous. If you have HIV, they would say, no, I use protection with you. So I don't have any problem. Even if you have a baby, they would say, no, I don't have a baby, I don't want a baby. So go and do abortion. You know, what, what, what he's got really into is using the camera. And like, you know, that's been kind of his thing. He's been the go-to cameraman all the way through the year. And then through that, um, I think we've all got to know him a little bit more. And, you know, his incredible story, really. Just press this, but this is a really nice camera. So you can see it gives you a really wide shot. What surprised me a bit is working with Pendolani and the other kids that use the safe parks, getting them to use film to help them think about how the world sees them has really started to make me reflect upon my use of film, you know, why I'm drawn to the story of a young man like Pendolani. So I guess my aim in this film really is to try to tell two stories. On the one hand, to reflect upon Pendolani's place as a member of the Born Free generation, the legacy of the past and how he sees his world today. And then also to reflect upon my relationship to this stuff and to think about what right I have to even attempt to tell his story. Uh, my name is Pendan M. Don't look at me instead. Don't look at the camera. I want me to laugh. This is a badge of my school. Swan, Swan. Swan, Swan. We can go there. So, ma'am, I need you. I need you to tell them everything about me. Ooh, that's a long story. Yeah, I knew Chambelani for about I don't know. It was twenty. I used to see him when I was standing by the gate there in the morning, and he looked so filthy. And I used to ask myself, what's happening with this boy? Uh, I was so worried about him. Uh, and then we had to, to, to call the social workers to come to his rescue because by then he was sleeping in a car and then he was taken to a place of safety. <laughs> when I started meeting with Pendulani, he was so mischief, but every child is like that. I was called by the school and uh, they were telling me about the, the difficulties that Pendulani was suffering from. He's clever, but he's very much short-tempered. It wasn't easy with Pendulan, because you know, if a child grew up without a father and a mother, it's very much difficult for these children. I think the fact that I've got kids, and I've got kids of a similar kind of age to these guys, definitely draws me to them. But there's something else going on, I think. I mean, I definitely kind of identify with the fact that these are vulnerable children and it's, and it's impossible not to think, you know, how would you respond, um, you know, imagining your kids being in a similar sort of situation. But there's also something about, you know, um, I kind of can't identify with what he's gone through, really. It's just so kind of foreign to me. I mean, I sort of, you know, I, I see that he's a child but the fact that he's, you know, he's experienced more, more life than me, certainly, in his 15 years. I mean, you know, the, the guy lived in a car for a while, you know. There's a real sense of something like, you know, it's not, so it's not really just the fact that I identify with him as a father, I think. I just think that there's something extraordinary about him as a person, really. And my first grade was there, first time when I was coming to the school. I was learning there. It was hard first to find friends. I was that person who don't like to speak to other children. So I, now I decided, no, if I can't speak with other children, that thing will make me anger because I have anger. The only one sport that I like is volleyball. But the first time when I was coming in, they said I can't play without a birth certificate. I, I think that birth certificate I didn't, I didn't have from my first time when my mother was still alive. I was telling myself that uh, everyone is saying to me, why I can't play volleyball? I can borrow a birth certificate from someone so that I can play. 
most of the children that are attending here, they don't have birth certificates because their parents don't have ID. So it's hard for us to, to, to go to home affairs and ask for them to help them. The problem that means for them, they can attend school from zero to grade 11, but when they go to grade 12, they're not going to write any metric because they were not born here. But the constitution says the child has the right to identity. The child has the right to have the name. The child has the right to have a home, you see. But it's not happening because now we are talking about children. And when, where they are coming from, there's a war. So they are running from there to here. As one of our people went to exile. So if they are coming here, why can't we help them? We are in the chamber. This is our container where we do our homework. I want to show yourself because it's important to be in safe park. Because in our community, there are more dangerous things that are happening. Some are smoking, yawupe, drugs. They affect me because when I see some, some children are smoking, I don't like it. Because it's very dangerous. Some of them, they do things that they don't want to do because of the situation. I think it's always difficult engaging in these sorts of situations. I wouldn't dare to compare my life with his life, really, because I just think, uh, you know, would I, would I have achieved what he's achieved if I had to deal with uh, what he had to go through? You know, who knows, maybe, you know, uh, I've never been tested in that way. But, um, so yeah, so maybe I'd do him a disservice by, by sort of saying that, you know, I'm not worthy to identify with his life, that I'm kind of reluctant to identify with him, you know, but I'm absolutely drawn to his story. And how does, what happens when you're drawn to somebody's story, on some level you identify with it or you find it sympathetic. But yeah, I mean, in some ways it's kind of really patronising, isn't it, of me to kind of want to put him into this kind of heroic narrative of having survived. This is our home first time when I come here, uh, I was this person who say I, I think my life was the end. But when I come here, I get a family that can support me. Uh, God give me the mother that can, can give me food, can give me house to sleep, can give me everything that I need as a child. He used to run away there by where he was staying. But since he came here, he never run away and he, he becomes a wise ch a child. The fact that I lost a parent and I was kind of vulnerable and I lost, I lost my, I mean, you know, the difference being, of course, he lost two parents. He was left very, very vulnerable. But yeah, I mean, maybe that's one of the reasons why I was kind of, you know, drawn to his story. Um, the fact that, you know, um, I lost my dad at a similar kind of age to the fact to, to when he lost his mother. But, you know, my life's been incredibly stable. You know, he'd take quite a contrary position. So um, there, was, there was one part of, uh, of, of, of the, the shoot when we were um, interviewing Lorraine, who runs the safe park, and she was talking about her experience during the student um, uprising of 1976 and the way that she was treated. And she had an all, a brutal time. In 76, I went back to school. I went to school and I told you that I was going to go by VCCs. We have to fight for these uh, Africans. So early in the morning, I woke up on the 16th of June. Then Satala Satwali Trata Sizabalaza Sizabalaza. So I was busy leading these other community members. Not knowing which he has the helicopter player person. They were policemen, they were not journalists. So I was busy throwing stones. Busy throwing stones to some of the students. Masi Hamba, Masi MC Porter. So, Silvi Sana Nalama Pono. Bayagela is a police dog. Police dog has put me, sir. I continued running. Temang Peggy Mover, I saw the dog was behind me. So I just find the nearest house. From that corner, it was the fourth house. Nangena corner, Chemangena corner. So I couldn't do anything. I just sit there. 
was she waiting for the policeman to come and arrest me. Instead of the policeman coming, it was a police dog. Ivule umlomo. Oksiga wan. It's where by E.E.E. Ya. Young Luma. Naman never was in Jala. I dream as in your words. Then it has been said, Popo, my gym. I couldn't walk properly. So I won't push away, but they were pushing me with their guns. They were hitting me with their guns on top of my head. And that led into a massive discussion about the legacy of apartheid and you know what's happening in, in, in South Africa today and the legacy of Mandela and you know and um, should should they forgive the people that brutalized them in the past and where is society going and Pendolani was really interesting because he was engaging really seriously with it but he wasn't coming out with any kind of stock answers I mean lots of them weren't and it's something that kind of comes from the fact that this is a this is a person who's really had to kind of um, hold their life together that not you know never take the kind of straightforward glib answer they've always had to try and work things out for themselves hey, this is my room and this is where the thing that I grow but the other five is not to me uh, this is some of them and this is the, the research this is really interesting because this is the kind of thing that I used to do definitely when I was a little kid I loved research I loved kind of having my files around me but I think I do also, yeah, I do identify with his seriousness. You know, I was a pretty serious little kid, I think. And, um, yeah, there's something, there's something about the fact that he's interested in politics. There's something about the fact that, you know, he wanted to show me his research and what his research meant to, meant to me, or meant to him. This is, uh, this is uh, the children that in the, the thousands of children work very hard in, in, for low wage. And these are children that are sleeping on the street. And this is when, in 1994, millions of South Africans waited for hours in a long shoot to for the tens of food. Democracy doesn't mean everything because some of some of us are st still uh, still poor. So I, all I want is everyone to be normal. Not some of us are rich and some of us are poor. Are poor so. This is Nelson Mandela and Tabumpeg. I think Mandela didn't done his work. If he done his work, all of us must be normal. No one is have a right to be poor. No one, everyone must be normal. I don't think he finished the job. Anyone now, when he gets man, he eats. Don't care about other people. I think now all we need is a youth people to lead. Some of us, we know everything and we can change in South Africa. If just South Africa can give us a chance. to see it so that they can learn something from me and me too I can learn something from them.